Hi, I'm Pat and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to discuss some of the awesome ideas that you folks left in the comments to my previous video about Sam Crack's BMW i8. If you're new to the channel, please click the subscribe button and ring that bell for notifications as I like producing cool car content. And don't forget to give the video a big thumbs up because that helps other people see it as well. First off, I am extremely grateful for the outpouring of questions, comments, and ideas in the last video. This actually caused me to think a little bit deeper about some of the things that I brought up in that previous video. If you're not familiar with what's going on, see the links in the description below where Sam works on his BMW i8 and I provide a response to those videos. So I have the engine compartment open to the BMW i8 because the first thing I want to talk about is how high this engine is compared to the front of the car where the radiator and the high temperature coolant circuit reservoir is located. So I have the lid off the engine compartment here and we can actually see this is the top of the engine. This is the acoustic cover to help keep noise down and underneath there is our valve cover, our head and eventually our block. And if we look straight through to the front of the car, this is actually the high point compared to the radiator and the coolant bottle that's up front. Now I've had a few folks actually say that if you raise the front of the car so that that part now becomes the high point and this is more of a low point, you can actually get some of those air bubbles out of the top of this engine and flowing forward. In fact, there were a couple BMW i8 technicians that replied to my video and said that's exactly what they had to do. They actually took the lift forks and they just put them here at the front of the car and tipped it up high enough in order to raise the front of the car and then perform the bleeding procedure. Now, it did still require multiple attempts to actually get it to be bled, but that's one idea that worked for several people. So when Sam does his bleeding, I recommend that Sam actually elevate the car. And one of the most popular questions that I received in the comment section of the last video, why don't you take the coolant temperature sensor that's at the top of the block and undo it a little bit? That way when you're filling the system, you could bleed off the air. Or why don't you take the coolant temperature sensor out completely and then use that hole in order to fill coolant to the top of the engine block? Well, that's a great idea, but we have a little bit of an issue. Let me show you. Now, in order to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about, let's get you in here closer to the engine. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at what we're dealing with. Of course, this is the front side of the car up there. So this is our firewall, and this engine compartment is very, very small. I'd say it's about one foot by two feet, approximately. And if we look up here, on the intake side of the engine. That silver piece that's right there, that component, that's the water-cooled intercooler that's integrated into the intake manifold of the car. Underneath there is where the coolant temperature sensor is located. It's nearly impossible for me to get my hand in there. I can't even reach it from the bottom of the car because, well, I've had the panel off the bottom of the car and I've actually tried to get some footage of what the other side of this engine looked like the last time I was doing service. So I decided to do some research to determine exactly how to get to this coolant temperature sensor. According to the BMW i8 service manual, you have to drop the entire subframe. You gotta pull the entire engine down. This was totally confusing to me. So I spent some time actually looking for used engines so that I can get an idea exactly where this is located and what's in the way. Now, I found this particular used engine, this long block, on the Pacific Motors website. And as we can see, in order to get to where that temperature sensor is located, we have to get past a lot of different components. Down here is exactly where the oil filter is located. And there's also a oil heat exchanger right here. And that prevents us from actually seeing where the coolant temperature sensor is located. The same is true if we try to come in from the side. You see where this block was cast in order to attach different gears for the cams. Well, that gets in the way from getting in from the side where I showed you previously at the top of the engine here. So that makes it so difficult that we can't even get to the coolant temperature sensor. But I also found a couple blocks and heads that were for sale on eBay that shows exactly where the temperature sensor is screwed into the block and also a little bit more information about the water jacket. As we can see here, this is where the coolant temperature sensor is located. 
Also, even though it's at the top of the block, it's not at the top of the water jacket. See these holes at the top of the block? They line up with the holes in the head. That means that the coolant is actually flowing at least a couple inches above that coolant temperature sensor. We can't use that sensor as a bleeder, and we can't use that sensor in order to fill the coolant from the top of the engine. Now a bunch of folks also recommended that Sam drill a hole and tap it and install some sort of a bleeder at the top. Well, because this water jacket extends into the head, I don't think that's going to be a possibility. In order to access the water jacket in the head, you'd probably need to remove the valve cover just to get to an area where you can install a bleeder at the very top. At that point, that's just way too much work. Now here is the rear of the car, so where the small back seats are located, and of course our engine compartment is in there. And some folks said, what if you cut an access hole in this area in order to be able to access that side of the engine? Well, this car is made of carbon fiber. It's a carbon fiber monocoque, and this is everywhere, including back here and of course under the seats. The entire life cell, is what they call it, is all carbon fiber. And what this means is if you actually cut into this, you'll actually compromise the integrity of the car. You don't want to do that, unfortunately. However, a nice access panel would make it super easy to be able to access that side of the engine. Now, some folks suggested that the thermostat was the problem, that the thermostat was stuck closed. Well, let me provide you with a little bit more information about how the thermostat on this car works. The large inlet on the thermostat housing is where the hose connects that goes up to the radiator on this car. There's also a small outlet and that runs to where the turbo gets cooled. That way when the mid-engine isn't running, this coolant can serve as coolant in order to keep the turbo cool after you've shut the car down. If we take a look at the inside of the thermostat housing, well that is where the impeller is located and that's where the feed goes into the mid-engine. But the thermostat that's located there isn't your average thermostat. It won't just open and close depending on how hot the coolant is in this area. There's actually a wire connector on the thermostat housing, and well, this makes the system even more complicated than you thought. Now in front of me is the service manual, and I'd like to read a little bit to you to explain exactly how that thermostat works. So, based on input variables, which are engine speed, load, driving speed, intake air temperature, and coolant temperature, the engine control calculates the optimum coolant temperature for every operating point. The coolant temperature is influenced by specific heating of a wax element in the characteristic MAP thermostat, as well as required oriented activation of the electric fan. At full load, Low coolant temperatures improve the cylinder filling. Moreover, the risk of knocking is reduced when the engine temperature is lower. This can be a positive influence on the power output and the torque. It goes on to say that the wax element of the characteristic MAP thermostat contains a heating resistor. The engine control supplies the heating resistor with current. This causes the wax element to expand and close the cylinder head inlet against the spring pressure of a spring. The spring has the task of pressing the characteristic MAP thermostat back into its rest position when the wax element cools down. When the engine is cold, the coolant circuit runs via the cylinder head inlet and the characteristic MAP thermostat to the return line towards the coolant pump. It says that the characteristic MAP thermostat is connected via a two-pin plug connection and the MAP thermostat is supplied with 12-volt vehicle voltage by the engine control. It also shows a little diagram here of the resistor and how it impacts this little wax element. So what does this mean? Well, it means that this is not a normal thermostat in this car. You can't just swap out a thermostat and expect the car to be working. This thermostat is controlled by the engine control unit. It opens and closes by heating a wax element, and it's one of the most weird and quirky thermostats I've ever heard about. So for all of you that have suggested it's just a thermostat, go ahead and replace it. This is a little bit more complicated than that. And in fact, if this thermostat wasn't working, it should probably throw a code. Now while we're talking about the thermostat housing, because that is the feed line from the radiator to the mid-engine, when Sam went ahead and vacuum bled the system down, he saw that collapse. 
he was looking at the right rear wheel entrance to the mid-engine. So where does the coolant flow after it exits the engine? Well, that's right up by that coolant temperature sensor. In fact, there's a little neck there that comes down, which means that you're gonna get air trapped even higher in the mid-engine water jacket. What a design. So that outlet then has a hose attached to it, which goes down to the bottom of the car and sort of forms a trap before it comes back up and then heads back towards the radiator as well as other components. And up there is an auxiliary heater, a couple of valves, there's more coolant pumps, etc. This system is very, very complicated. So while Sam applies vacuum to this system and he's able to make those hoses collapse on the inlet side of the engine, I think he should also take a look underneath the car where a triangular cut is in order to take the oil filter off the bottom of the car he can see that hose and verify that that's also collapsing when he applies vacuum. That way he can actually start to see whether or not there's a restriction inside the coolant system for the car. That leads us to the next thing. A lot of people said, I really believe that this coolant system has an obstruction in it. And that's very possible. In fact, many people had said when Sam's technician went ahead and pumped up the system and the radiator blew apart, well, that just says that there's nowhere else for that pressure to go. Something is keeping that pressure at the front of the car, and that's probably a good indication that the rest of the system is blocked off or closed off with something. Sam really needs to get the underbody panels of this car off, and he needs to check those coolant hoses in order to see whether or not there is an obstruction. I received a few comments that actually included stories about discoveries that several people have made in some used cars that they bought when they were having overheating issues, when they disconnected the radiator, they found things in there. So that's a distinct possibility. Sabotage is still on the table. This video doesn't cover all the ideas that everyone brought up, but I'm eternally grateful for you reaching out and letting me know your thoughts. Because there are quite a few intellectual people out there, engineers, mechanics, DIYers, that have so many good ideas, and it's awesome to hear them. Every time that we share a little bit more information with each other, we all grow. So thank you for that. And thank you for all the new subscribers, everyone that clicked that like button and dropped a comment. I'm feeling very grateful to you all. I really appreciate it. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and ring that bell for notifications. Give this video a big thumbs up. I truly appreciate it. Stay tuned for more. Thanks for watching and happy motoring.